Hi, welcome to the, the Smith Family Foundation debate series. This debate tonight is co-sponsored with the Federalist Society and the American Constitutionalist Society. My name is Aaron Russell. I'm the executive director of the Smith Family Foundation. Tonight's d debate, should international law be part of our law, uh, will be moderated by Dean Tony Fine. She recently joined the Fordham faculty as assistant dean for international and non-JD programs. She's responsible for oversight and development of all aspects of the law school's international and non-JD program. She joined us from Cardozo Law School. Uh, prior to that, she was with NYU and George Washington. She's authored many articles uh, and two books, American Legal Systems, a resource and reference guide, and US Legal Systems and Methodologies. She's a graduate with honors from Duke Law School in SUNY Binghamton. Please welcome Dean Fine. Thank you, Aaron. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of this evening's event, especially the Smith Family Foundation. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you here today. As you know, the topic for discussion this evening is should international law be part of our law? This issue discusses the appropriateness of US courts looking to international and foreign legal norms when confronted with difficult issues of constitutional interpretation. This issue came to the fore as a result of three relatively recent Supreme Court decisions, two involving the death penalty and one involving the right of intimate private contact between homosexuals. This is, as, as your presence here tonight suggests, a highly divisive issue uh, that has attracted an unusual amount of attention between the Supreme Court justices themselves, judges both from the United States and abroad, legal academics, members of Congress, and even the popular press. There are a number of arguments that have been made uh, primarily by judges and academics in favor of and against what I'll call judicial borrowing, which our speakers will discuss in greater detail. In general, the arguments in favor of judicial borrowing is that simply it makes good judicial sense for our judges to learn from jurists in other countries who have explored similar challenging legal questions, that it appropriately bolsters judicial power, and that it respects the universality of human rights and norms. On the other hand, arguments have been made against judicial borrowing, and they include reference to American exceptionalism, Anti the, the, the theory that it's anti-democratic and that it impermissibly expands judicial discretion and is subject to manipulation and distortion, what has been called cherry picking and nose counting. Uh, it's a special honor to welcome our two experts on this issue who will debate and discuss this question. To my immediate left, Professor Martin Flaherty, and to his last left, Professor Ronald Cass, we're especially grateful to Professor Kess for stepping in at the last moment. As some of you know, Professor McGinnis was ill and unable to make the trip. Professor Flaherty uh, is professor uh, at Fordham School of Law and co-director of the Crowley Program in International Human Rights here at Fordham. He's also chair of the Committee on International Human Rights at the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. Uh, he served as a visiting fellow in the program in law and public affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He served as law clerk to the Honorable Byron White of the Supreme Court of the United States and to the Honorable John Gibbons of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. He's been a visiting professor all over the world, including in Beijing at the China University of Political Science at Law, at Columbia Law School, he was a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar uh, as a JD student and the book review and articles editor of the Columbia Law Review. He holds a master's in philosophy and is a PhD candidate at Yale University in the history department. He's also been a Fulbright fellow at Trinity College Dublin and holds a bachelor's in history from Princeton University. Ronald Cass is currently the president of Cass and Associates. Uh, he is uh, vice chairman of the ITC, he was appointed by President George H.W. Bush, and is chair of the Federal Society Practice Group on International Law and National Security. He is co-chair of the American Bar Association International Law Section and Intellectual Property Committee. He's the reporter for Intellectual Property EU-US Task Force, uh, in a network in, in Brussels, 
uh, is an arbitrator for NAFTA Chapter 11 cases, an ISSID arbitrator, chairman of the Center for the Rule of Law, and I could go on and on, but I'm sure you'd rather hear from them than from me if I could just finish by saying that he was served as a law clerk to the Honorable Colin Sates, the Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, is a graduate with honors of the University of Chicago Law School, uh, and graduated with a bachelor's from the University of Virginia. The format will be as follows. We will hear from Professor Flaherty for 15 minutes. We will then hear from Professor Cass for 15 minutes. Each of the speakers will then have five minutes of rebuttal time, and then I will have uh, some questions and hopefully we'll get some good answers from our speakers. Thank you, and Professor Flaherty. Um, thank you, Tony. I too would like to thank uh, the sponsors, the Smith Family Foundation, as well as uh, the ACS and the Federalist Society. Um, uh, and I would very much like to thank um, Dean Cass for coming uh, at such short notice. Um, I think it shows it's his commitment or shows his commitment to uh, uh, the topic. It arguably will also show his commitment to refuting anything I have to say. Um, and mindful that he used to be dean of Boston University Law School, I inferred that it also shows his commitment to uh, rubbing it into a Yankee fan in light of what happened uh, over the weekend. Um, now let me start uh, with what I usually don't do, which is a couple of quotes from Supreme Court cases, uh, but they're not any of the ones that uh, Dean Fine uh, talked about. One, I'll just uh, mention uh, without uh, discussing the title uh, or who wrote it at first. The Constitution of the United States was uh, uh, framed at a time when this particular rule of international law introduced by commerce in favor of moderation and humility was received throughout the civilized world. In expanding that constitution, a construction ought not lightly to be admitted, which would give to this certain constitutional provision, it happens to be the Declare War Clause, an effect in this country it does not possess elsewhere, and which would fetter that exercise of entire discretion respecting uh, enemy property, and it goes on. Essentially, it's saying, look, one way to read it, it's a somewhat ambiguous passage, but one way to read it is uh, uh, do not lightly adopt constructions of the Constitution that uh, would uh, place us in some sort of violation or that are in tension with international law. Um, another quote, and then I'll sort of reveal where these are from, another quote comes from a more recent case, but still not anything from uh, the uh, Roberts or Rehnquist courts. Um, it says, I am not convinced that it would be wise to depart from the original, and then I'll add, from the original intent concerning the fact that there are no emergency provisions in the Constitution for the most part. Um, although many modern nations have forthrightly recognized that war and economic crises may upset the normal balance between liberty and authority, their experience of modern nations with emergency powers may not be irrelevant to the argument here that we should say um, that the executive of his own volition can invest himself with undefined emergency powers. And then the opinion goes on to three case studies. It goes on to the experience of unfettered executive power, this is particularly relevant, uh, uh, in Germany uh, uh, in the years leading up to this case, uh, happened to be in the 30s, of the French Republic, and also of the United Kingdom. And the opinion concludes, this contemporary foreign experience may be inconclusive as to the wisdom of lodging emergency powers somewhere in a modern government. But it suggests that emergency powers are consistent with free government only when their control is lodged elsewhere than the executive who exercises them. In other words, there should be legislative checks. The first opinion comes in a case from um, uh, uh, the pen of Chief Justice John Marshall in 1814, a famous case called Brown versus United States. The second comes from the uh, uh, opinion of uh, Justice Jackson in the famous Youngstown versus Ohio case. In other words, these are not cases or not opinions by you know, radical modern current justices like the infamous Anthony Kennedy. These are, that was a joke, these are, <laughs> although I've been at Federalist Society debates and it's not a joke there, actually. Um, but these are examples of uh, 
justices invoking and referring to international law on the one hand and comparative law on the other hand in the exercise of trying to construe important doctrines and provisions of the US Constitution. That, of course, is the subject tonight. Um, Dean Fine has done a very good job uh, setting forward, so I won't talk about the cases of uh, Roper, Lawrence, and Atkins, the three kind of, uh, three of the modern cases in which the current controversy uh, has developed. Um, other than to say that this practice of judicial borrowing is fairly standard in most of the rest of the world. And as these examples show, it's been more standard in our history than you might think. Uh, in fact, as people are starting to write studies and do studies on this question, they are finding examples, uh, such as the two I uh, referred to, um, to refute the idea that this is some newfangled thing that the court, thanks to Justice Kennedy and others of his ilk, have been doing you know, recently. Um, now, there's lots to be said on this, but the one thing I want to do and set out for myself here, among many other things, is set out what I think is the toughest task before anyone defending this practice, which is to do two things. Defend it on the basis that it is consistent with our democratic principles, because I don't think people who have defended this practice have engaged its critics on that front, including Justice Breyer. Um, and secondly, what I want to make an argument for is that in certain narrow contexts, um, uh, foreign legal materials should actually have some, something more than persuasive weight. In other words, that they should be mildly binding. Um, I'll get to that, but on route, let me give you a quick roadmap. First, I want to spend a very little time clarifying a certain, uh, some terms and some issues. Then I want to proceed to at least my characterization of the critiques of this practice, the criticisms of this practice, and then refute them. And in the course of refuting them, try to build a justification in particular, as I said, on the ground that this practice is fully consistent um, uh, with uh, our democratic principles, which I take it to be as the principal problem in the eyes of most critics. Okay, in terms of clarifications, um, just a couple of, uh, uh, one point on terms. Uh, I will use the term foreign law as an umbrella term for two different kinds of law. One is international law, which is the law that binds nation states. Um, that is largely uh, a result of treaties, either between two nations or amongst many nations. Um, or what's called customary international law, what in the 18th century was often known as the law of nations, which is roughly analogous to kind of substantive due process tradition. Um, the idea is that if a whole lot of countries for a whole lot of time adopt a certain practice out of some sense of obligation, that becomes a binding norm on all nations unless one of them has opted out. So those are the two principal forms of international law. With regard to comparative law, what does that mean? Comparative law is simply what do other nations do in similar circumstances. Now, a lot of people in this area try to draw sharp distinctions between those two types of law. Uh, and in particular, they try to do it to say, well, at least international law, uh, especially if the United States is somehow bound, there there's a stronger claim to some sort of a notice by the Supreme Court of that. I don't want to go there. In fact, I want to collapse the distinction for the following reason. For most of what we were talking about, and take, for example, the juvenile death penalty case, the distinction tends to collapse. Um, the practice of many nations in the juvenile death penalty setting was out of the 190 or so nations of the world, about 188 had rejected the practice. And the only ones that hadn't were Iran, Iraq, I think Myanmar, China, and the United States of America, right? Now, that is a point where comparative law and international law come together in the form of customary international law. Remember I said when a whole lot of nations agree on a principle for a significant amount of time, it becomes a rule of international law. So, um, so I don't want to make any big distinction because for the kinds of cases we're talking about, I think the two generally become one. The other thing I want to say uh, by way of kind of uh, uh, initial clarifications is most people, most people who defend the practice, not me, but most people who defend the practice merely say that it should be taken into account, that it should be given persuasive weight, that it should be consulted in the way that law review articles are consulted, 
Um, and I could give you much better arguments as to why law review articles should not be consulted as opposed to international law when it comes to what judges do, uh, being a perpetrator of same. Um, but that is, you know, most people when they talk about that, including the Supreme Court, including Justice Kennedy, say, look, all we are doing is you know, consulting it as persuasive weight. How have other countries interpreted similar provisions in their constitution, if we're going to look at the comparative law edge? It's not binding. It's, it's relevant information, and we're acknowledging the use of that relevant information. Um, I want to go, go say something further and say that in certain contexts, it should actually have some binding weight. But most, but I'm a heretic on that. Most of the people who defend the practice, including the justices, say no more than what I've just said. OK. Let me get to the critiques and then get to the defenses. In terms of the critiques, there are, I would say, essentially two bundles. A non-democratic set of critiques, which I frankly don't take seriously, and a democratic set of critiques, which I think people should take seriously. The non-democratic set of critiques runs something like this. Look, this is an area, this is a source to consult that is very easily manipulated by courts. It is something where you can cherry pick. You could choose the countries you want to look at. You can choose the international law principles you want to look at. You can manipulate this source and find in it anything you want to find. So that's the sort of non-democratic set of objections. The democratic set of object, ob objections are put forward very elegantly and strongly in typical fashion by the redoubtable Justice Scalia, which is to say, look, we make our own constitutional law, not foreigners. We, the people of the United States, ordain and establish this constitution, not the people of Russia, China, Myanmar, you know, the United Kingdom, Sweden, or you know, other similar um, crazy and uh, off-the-wall countries. OK. Now, that was also meant to be a joke. <laughs> For those of you with no sense of irony. Okay. Now. What are the responses to this? Let me give you a general response, then a response just as to the, the uh, selectivity challenge, and then say something a little bit more about uh, a response to the democratic challenge. As a general rejoinder, I return to the notion of what most people argue, which is most people argue this is just something to be consulted, like law review articles, like uh, economics treatises. It's relevant information. And um, you know, that is uh, uh, a good thing. In fact, my main baseline uh, as to this response is what I call the Faber College idea. Some of you got this. Faber College was the college in Animal House. And if you remember at the beginning of Animal House, they pan over the statue of the founder of Faber College. And the motto of the college is, knowledge is good. Right. So, you know, generally speaking, having more knowledge rather than less knowledge is a good thing. Okay. Now, there's a fancier way of saying this. Eric Posner at the University of Chicago uh, has referred in this context to the Condorcet theorem by the 18th century French philosopher Condorcet, which says that chances are the more people who come to a certain thesis, the more likely that thesis is to be true. Okay. Um, and Posner is no friend of international law, but he thinks that um, more knowledge is good is a good thing. Now, so what must the criticism be? The criticism has to be that foreign law is inherently so manipulable compared to other sources that it really just can't be admitted into the conversation. Um, my response to this as someone who spent most of his career critiquing the way people do original intent is, please. Pollies, you know, uh, welcome to the law. Whenever one resorts to other areas of uh, outside the law or indeed in the law, it's all subject to manipulation. And take it from me, there is nothing that has been more abused, manipulated, misused than the history of the founders by both liberal and conservative originalists. I mean, I started out as an 18th century historian, so I know, I think I know a little bit about this. And the irony is that originalists, and some of the originalists who are the worst offenders when it comes to cherry picking history, are the ones who are the first ones to say, oh no, but you can't use this source of law, okay? So that is generally my response to the selectivity problem. Um, and now that I'm virtually out of time, I'll get to the main portion of my remarks. Um, <laughs> let me just say that um, 
here is uh, basically my argument on the Democratic side, because I do think that's a serious you know, uh, objection to this. This is not, you know, you're interpreting our Constitution, um, even discounting the fact that it's only persuasive, you know, don't we want to focus on what we the people have said, our practices, all of that. Um, my response is twofold on this. It, I have a backward-looking way of thinking about this, um, a historical way, and a forward-looking way of thinking about this. The backward-looking, and the context is that it can be a binding tiebreaker. And my analogy here is a legal doctrine called the Charming Betsy Canon. Um, Charming Betsy referred to a boat, not a person. Um, but what the Supreme Court established long ago was that when statutes are ambiguous, when you can't figure out what an act of Congress says, whatever else, interpret it in a way that will avoid a violation of international law, um, so long as that is humanly possible to do so. And what I want to argue is a similar kind of approach to the Constitution. As a tiebreaker, when you really can't figure out, uh, when the domestic arguments you know, are very strong both ways, the tiebreaker should be, let's be good international citizens and interpret it in a way that reflects international law or a majority comparative law um, uh, process. Now, what, on what basis do I offer that uh, in, in, in democratic terms? Uh, what basis do I justify that position? The backward looking one is a possibility. And I'm the first one to admit it's a possibility given what I said about original understanding and the use of history. My hunch, although it would take several years to prove one way or the other, is contrary to Justice Scalia's glib assumptions on this point, it may well be that the founding understanding on this point was exactly that, where possible, interpret the Constitution in a way that's consistent with the law of nations and international law. Um, uh, had I the time, I could go through, and maybe during question and answer, go through the reasons in historical sources and in historical terms that lead me to say that. Suffice it to say, at this point, that the founders were internationalists in many important ways. And one of the main reasons for the Constitution was to comport with our international law obligations that had been violated under the Articles of Confederation. But, true to my own words, I'm not going to offer that as a conclusive argument. I just want to hold open the possibility, which seems to be assumed away, that the founders would have thought, including the one in front of me here, James Madison, would have thought that interpreting the Constitution uh, in a way consistent with international law, all things being equal, is better rather than worse. That's that backward-looking argument. The forward-looking argument is one that actually comes out of my time uh, at Princeton, and this is a hard one to reduce into you know, uh, 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 kind of sound bites, but let me just give it a quick try. A um, lot of work in international relations talks about how nation states no longer interact one against another, but instead executives and regulators uh, in uh, nation states deal with their count police forces in the UK and the US deal with their counterparts in other countries. Legislators do it too, and so do courts. Judges schmooze at nice places like Florence, and they give kind of what Mark Tushnet calls judicial shout outs. They cite each other, right? These are all forms of globalization, right? There is executive globalization, legislative globalization, judicial globalization. The question is, what is the effect on doctrines like, in particular, separation of powers, which are certainly part, in our view, of any well-run, well-ordered democracy? My hypothesis is that, and I think most of the IR work on this shows, that the net winner in any particular country out of this process are the executive branches. In other words, executive branches have gotten more powerful over time through this kind of interaction and have left legislatures behind and courts behind. And so if globalization is leading to much more powerful executives, which in turn creates an imbalance among the branches, which in turn violates many of the precepts that our friend Mr. Madison there in front of me advocated, then it seems nuts to tie the hands of the judiciary when it comes to, and use whatever they can do in terms of globalization, including judicial shout outs, to try to redress the balance. So uh, that is a very telegraphed version of an international relations theory that is consistent with democracy for some strong resort to international comparative law. 
So um, that is it from me. Um, I, I do not want to go over my time any more than I have, and I thank you for listening. It's a delight to, to be here. Uh, I wasn't sure partway through the day whether I would get here or not. Uh, as Professor Flaherty uh, mentioned, I spent 14 years as a dean at Boston University, so I'm much more used to uh, shaking hands and picking pockets than I am to substantive <laughs> debate. Uh, so you'll, you'll have to forgive me if I uh, uh, have uh, you know, the occasional lapse here. Mm -hmm. I also was glad that Professor Flaherty went first and demonstrated for the audience that if you're telling a joke, you have to, to telegraph that. So I will, <laughs> I, I will let you know that I'm going to begin with a joke, and I will let you know when the punchline is so you know uh, what, what to do. Um, my wife, uh, who uh, accompanied me here as my law partner, she's also a Yankees fan, so we have a, a mixed marriage. Um, uh, my wife uh, came out of the beauty parlor the other day uh, uh, with a friend of hers, and her friend and she saw a uh, sort of strange sight. Uh, they saw a hearse followed by another hearse, followed by a woman dressed in black, who was walking a dog on a leash, looked like a, a pit bull. And behind her in single file were about a thousand women. Um, my wife thought it was interesting but had to go pick up our, our little girl, uh, left. Her friend went up to the woman walking the dog and said, you know, I've never seen something like this. We're not in New Orleans, we're in suburban DC. What, what's going on? Who's in the hearse? The woman said, it's my husband. How did he die? She pointed to the dog, said the dog, actually killed him. Uh, he was having an argument with me. The dog went berserk, killed my husband. Who's in the second hearse? My mother-in-law. What happened? She tried to intervene, and the dog killed her. And uh, Susie's friend thought for a minute and then said to the woman, can I borrow your dog? <laughs> and the woman, of course, said to her, get in line. <laughs> There are times when things seem like a good idea. We all kind of line up behind them. We kind of fall into place. Uh, clearly, to those of us who are men, that doesn't seem like a, a great idea. Uh, there are a lot of different uses of foreign and international law. I want to quickly run through a few of them before uh, saying why it is that I think we're engaged in the debate we have today. First of all, there is the use uh, of analogy. And uh, Professor Flaherty mentioned that uh, more information is generally better than less. Uh, that's true in a lot of contexts. And if you have a relatively underdeveloped legal system with relatively few uh, guideposts to what you're supposed to do, looking to foreign and international law for guidance is often quite useful. And there was a lot of that going on at the beginning of the Republic, particularly for common law judges who were making decisions without a lot of positive legal material. Uh, secondly, uh, Foreign and international law may be incorporated as governing law. There are cases that turn expressly on international law. A lot of admiralty cases, you're not surprised to hear names like the Charming Betsy, the Packet Habana. A lot of the cases where we invoke international law, the law of nations, are cases involving admiralty, the law of the sea, law where nations have to agree on how they're going to treat uh, boats and things on them and ownership of them. Uh, in Hamdan against Rumsfeld, a case that was decided by the Supreme Court last summer, uh, the Supreme Court said that the U.S. Congress had expressly decided that the law of nations was one of the laws we had to look to in interpreting a provision of U.S. law. So all of the discussion about the uh, common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions that came out of that decision and swirled around after it was based on the proposition that our Congress, our uh, governing authority, had made the Geneva Convention binding on us for certain purposes of domestic law. A third possible use of foreign and international law is as a set of default rules. If you don't have well worked out rules and you don't know what to do, it may be that instead of relying on simply your assumption of what the law might be if it were well written, you can look to international or foreign law. Um, we have a variety of circumstances where 
There is no clear rule. A lot of these involve international commercial transactions. I spend some time as an international arbitrator, and there are frequently cases where we are looking at default rules. But generally, these are cases where parties have agreed in advance to a framework for resolving conflicts and have already agreed what the basic criteria are going to be. Now, none of the uses I've just talked about very quickly are the uses that we're really discussing today. None of these are what is in contest when we talk about the problems of the use of foreign and international law. What is in contest today is the use of foreign and international law to define what US law is, to define the terms in our constitution, to define what we mean. And as Professor Flaherty indicated, there are a number of different objections to this. He's collapsed them into two buckets. One is the bucket that this is manipulable. The other is the bucket that it's undemocratic. I, I think both buckets are right, and I would like to speak uh, in behalf of both of those criticisms. What really happens when we're using, let me talk about manipulability first. We talk about using international law. We're not talking about people doing a careful study of international law. We're not talking about people who have serious research in this. We're talking about the Google effect. You turn on the computer, you flip through, you're looking for a few good quotes, and you choose the ones that you like. When we look to the law of Zimbabwe, we don't look to it across the board. We look to it because it happens to come out the right way in a particular case. When we look to certain aspects of customary international law in our constitutional jurisprudence, we don't look at them systematically and consistently. We look at them because we want to have something that supports the way the majority is going at the time. This is usually a sort of fashion. We're citing things that make us feel good. We're citing things that are well received in certain places. It's much better, I, I can say this since about a third of our business is in Europe, it's much better to have invitations to lunch and dinner in Paris than it is in Pawtucket or in Yonkers or some of the other places you can go if your background uh, leads you to cite different authorities. Uh, quite a lot of the Supreme Court justices spend time abroad. They spend time, a lot of them, in Europe. Uh, some of them are fluent in other languages. Uh, when you read their opinions, many of you may think they are speaking other languages. <laughs> but this is, is more like the law review articles deciding all at once we are going to cite Wittgenstein or Derrida or Habermas or whoever is in vogue this year. A lot of what you are seeing in the Supreme Court opinions that refers to international and foreign law really is providing cover. It is looking out, uh, as Justice Scalia said, it's looking over an audience and picking your friends. It's not doing a systematic survey of how people govern themselves. We don't systematically look at the same sources for all purposes. Even more, we are likely, when we look at international law and are not trained as international lawyers, to overlook the most obvious features of international law. And if you look at what the Supreme Court has done in citing international law, more often than not, the international law that is being cited is international law that is not binding on us, that has been expressly rejected by us, that we have looked at, considered, and decided not to adopt. And let me give you just a few quick examples. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, invoked the 1979 convention favoring the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. This was one of the sources she consulted in arriving at her decisions in the affirmative action cases. It is a convention to which the United States is not a party. The United States looked at the convention and said, we don't want that binding us. To have a Supreme Court justice look to that for guidance when we've decided not to have it bind us is really quite odd since the Constitution does bind us. That's the document we should be looking at. That's what it is that the justice is supposedly interpreting. Uh, justice Kennedy, uh, whom uh, Professor Flaherty noted, looked uh, in Roper and Simmons at the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and particularly at Article 6.5 of that convention. The United States is a signatory to that convention. We did, however, take a, an exception to that particular article. We took a reservation that expressly said, we do not want to be bound by that article. We don't think it applies appropriately to us. Again, to have the Supreme Court saying, this is the law we should look to, 
when those who are our elected representatives have expressly said we don't want to be bound by that is odd indeed. Uh, another convention that was looked to in Roper and Sibbins is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is another convention the United States decided not to sign. Now we can say a lot of other people signed it. That's fine. A lot of nations sign things they don't expect to obey at all. And the nations that have the strongest record for signing a lot of these conventions are among the nations with the worst records on the subjects of the conventions. If you don't intend to abide by it, it's very easy to agree to it. You know, are you going to eat your spinach? Absolutely. You, you betcha. You know, I, I've, I've been so pleased to see spinach getting in trouble in the news. You know, it's, it's taken me a lot of years to say to my mother, you see, I was right. This stuff will kill you. In, in looking at uh, the law and saying that we're going to pick and choose certain things that we like, one of the things that uh, people look at is how many people are doing this. Why does it matter how many people are doing this? When my forebears left Germany and Austria in the face of anti-Jewish pogroms and emigrated to the United States seeking relief from religious persecution, they didn't care that it was very popular back in Germany and Austria. They didn't want people in the United States looking back at Germany and Austria and Russia and Poland and saying, they all do it, we should do it too. When our forebears from wherever they came fled to the United States seeking relief from persecution, they didn't flee here so that we could look back at the governments they left and saying it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. What we have done is we have written a constitution to govern ourselves. We've written it with certain things in mind and we've given it over to people that we select by our processes to interpret and enforce. We want those people who have sworn an oath of allegiance to our Constitution to do their best to figure out what it does mean, what it did mean, how it should apply. Doing that doesn't mean looking to what others have done just because lots of others have done it. It's very easy when you look at materials to say, well, they're all manipulable. Sure they are. But they're not all equally manipulable. It's easy to say the justices don't know a great deal about history. They know even less about foreign history. They know even less about foreign law. They know even less about foreign materials. It's very important not to fall into the all or nothing trap. And if the justices misuse other sources, that's not a good reason to give them a particularly undemocratic and particularly manipulable source to use. Let me close by relating simply one more story. Uh, two elderly Jewish men who were lifelong friends were sitting down over breakfast one morning reading the paper. And one realized that the other was reading an Arab newspaper. And he said to his, his, his friend, how can you be reading the Arab news? You know, what, what, what is it? What, what, what are you doing? And his friend looked at him and said, ah, you know, for years I read the Jewish newspapers and what did I discover? We're oppressed, we're persecuted, nobody likes us, we're hated around the world, we have no power, we're nothing. Now I read the Arab news and what do I discover? We own the banks, we own the movie theaters, we run the world, it's wonderful. Thank you, good speaking to you today. Uh, rebut a few uh, points. Um, I feel I should come up with some rival jokes, but you know what can I say? <laughs> um, I can't think of an Irish joke, but it's on point at the moment, so I'll just move on. Um, a couple of uh, two or three points. One, um, uh, Dean Cass, I think, said in passing as one, uh, or at least implied. I'm not sure he uh, stated outright that G. You know, some of these early references or early reliance uh, on international and foreign law uh, in the United States may be a phenomenon that one sees today. New fledgling democracies, you know, that don't have a rich jurisprudence will often look to international law uh, uh, as gap fillers, but once they, you know, develop their own ideas and rules, then that's much less of a reason to uh, look abroad. 
Um, yes, perhaps, but there's a problem. The problem goes back to what I was talking about before, and this is something that should resonate in the Federalist Society, which is if the original understanding of the Constitution, if what is entrenched in an understanding of the higher law is that when in doubt, interpret the Constitution um, in a way that's consistent with the law of nations, even if that was adopted arguably because we were a weak fledgling republic, and I'm not sure that that was at all would have been the only reason for that position. You know, as Justice Scalia fondly says, if you know, we the people adopt a certain position at time one and things change, amend the Constitution. You know, don't use you know fancy schmancy judicial you know methods and arguments to get out of what the original understanding was. So again, if and it's a big if, but if that is the original understanding, and we should at least be open to the fact that it might be, because there is ample reason to think so, then you just can't get out of it that way. You've got to say if that's the original understanding, then you know amend the Constitution. With regard to manipulability, um, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. There is nothing, nothing, am I being clear? Nothing that has been more manipulated in our history, in, in the history of Supreme Court justices, particularly recently, than history. That is an area where they have almost no training, at least in law. You can sort of figure out what, you know, gee, there's a constitution of Ireland, a constitution of Turkey. It kind of looks sort of kind of like ours, especially since ours influenced them. In terms of trying to make sense of the morass of information that history throws at you, uh, you know, talk about invitations which are often taken up for cherry picking. So, you know, I, I don't know how I can prove that to you other than for you to read my incredibly long, boring articles castigating both law professors and justices for manipulating history, liberal and conservative. But, you know, and then what the rejoinder is, well, two wrongs don't make a right. Yes, but it's a sort of odd argument that, well, gee, history will use, you know, particularly from Justice Scalia, that is going to be our sure guide to what the Constitution means, even though it's incredibly manipulable, even though I won't admit it, but not foreign law. Um, and if everything's manipulable, then I say yes, all in or all out. You've got to show me, and I think the burden is on those who would oppose the use of foreign law, to show that it is significantly more manipulable than any other source history, economics, philosophy, law review articles, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you are just not going to carry that burden with me as someone who knows a wee bit about uh, 18th century history, that that is true of foreign laws as opposed to history. Um, then with regard, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, stop there other than wait just one other point. I'll skip over another point, which is, yeah, sure. It's one thing to say, you know, we fled Germany, we, you know, my forebears fled Ireland and Ukraine, you know, and uh, we really don't want to be guided by that, uh, by their, you know, oppressive ways. That's one argument, but it strikes me as intuitively, and I hope it does, at least some of you out there, another kind of argument when you say, look, and here I'm just going to argue persuasive information. Is it relevant? Is it significant as we think about what the Eighth Amendment means with regard to things like the juvenile death penalty and with regard to things like execution of uh, mentally challenged people, that out of the 200 nations in the world, 195 have repudiated the practice for a significant amount of time. And even within the United States, most states have repudiated the practice. So on the one side of the ledger, you've got you know, most of the rest of the world, including most of the rest of the country, um, versus Iran, Iraq, Myanmar, China, and us. I just don't think that's irrelevant information. I think it's perfectly fine for the uh, Supreme Court to take note of that. Um, and it's hard for me to understand the argument that the court should willfully put on blinders and act like that has no bearing on the issue. Thank you. Dean Cass. Let me do just two quick rejoinders. I mean, we'll get to the Irish jokes later. It's, uh, I'm, I'm uh, counting uh, on you to come up with I, them. I, you I, 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 do, I do have a few, but what? Uh, I mean, there is. You might be saying I'm the Irish joke, but that's another question. I, I, I would never say that. There is, of course, the, the question of, of burden here. I think the burden is not actually on people who are objecting to uh, the misuse of 
of international and foreign law to persuade people that people shouldn't misuse it. I think quite the contrary. When you look at a question like, what does the Eighth Amendment mean? The answer is, well, what's a good rule? What, you know, what's a good rule? What do other civilized nations think? What do people we like think? How am I going to feel if I'm in the same company as this country or that country? That, that isn't what the Constitution says. It doesn't say to justices, go do what you think is best. Go interpret this as you think it's right. Go enact whatever rules you think are appropriate. It says, we prohibit the use of cruel and unusual punishment. It has to be both cruel and unusual. And what it meant there was punishments that are deemed cruel, at least at this time, and are unusual, not common punishments. Now, it's up to the court to figure out what that term means. It's not up to the court to say, if we were writing this afresh today, who would we look to for guidance? It's not up to the court to say, if we were trying to figure out what punishments we think are good punishments, what would we do? This is the worst of unpredictable and unaccountable. And what we've done by introducing yet another manipulable sorts of law into our constitution, constitutional jurisprudence is to make what the justices are doing harder to predict in advance and certainly harder to justify as within the limited role that we give judges under the rule of law. Thank you both for your very interesting and provocative comments. I'm sure there'll be questions from the audience uh, later, but I'd like to begin with what I think is a very broad question. Um, Justice O'Connor said that all of this is really much ado about nothing. Uh, on the other hand, Justice Kennedy has been called the most dangerous man in America <laughs> in, a, in a veiled <laughs> reference to Professor Flaherty's comments earlier. Um, has it made a difference? Will it make a difference? What has happened in the lower courts? What will happen in the lower courts? And what will happen in the Supreme Court now that there's been a significant change in membership? And I'll let you gentlemen decide who will speak first to that question. I, I'm happy to take a first crack at this. I, I think on this point right now, uh, Justice O'Connor is right. It is right now much ado about nothing because by and large what the justices are doing is not making any serious decision about international law. What they're doing is they're looking for the right citations to make them feel good about what they're doing and to make them well received in certain quarters. It would be a very dangerous thing if we were actually making decisions on this basis, if this were actually guiding the court as Justice Kennedy would like it to. And let me just say, you know, sort of one part of what makes this different than some of the other sources we look to. In doing international arbitration, one of the cases I'm doing, we have a text. The text that we are interpreting has three formal languages it is adopted in. Those of us on the panel who speak those languages know that there are slight differences in the connotation language to language. The justices, if they want to take seriously the texts of all these different countries, are going to have a really daunting task in trying to figure out what they really mean in the language in which they are written, much less what that should mean for us. Yeah, my quick rejoinder on that is uh, do uh, 18th century and 17th century research, and you'll find really quickly that uh, 18th century, in fact, it's even potentially more misleading because words that seem to be words that we think we know have actually changed meanings over time. So if we're going to talk about how language might uh, lead us uh, astray, uh, again, I would say uh, uh, the types of history that are usually pointed to in this area um, uh, uh, are at least as misleading, and I would argue more so than uh, even foreign languages, because it's at least justices who don't know foreign languages um, don't have the hubris to think that they can, you know, figure it out very easily. Uh, to answer Dean Fine's question, I mean, here uh, I'm surrounded by deans. Dean, uh, Dean Cass, and I actually agree. I don't think it's really made much of a difference so far. And my argument uh, would be that cabined in the way I say, it won't make much of a difference. In other words, um, the way the Supreme Court has utilized international law has been along the fairly cautious, judicious ways I've argued. I mean, it has come up in the context of, you know, 
what does the rest of the world say about a particular issue? Well, 195 countries, you know, say one thing, five say the other. That's not cherry picking, it doesn't strike me. You know, that seems to reflect an international consensus. And that's why when I was talking before about, you know, I would say, look, if the Supreme Court starts cherry picking and saying we want to get here and we're going to choose Zimbabwe, the Netherlands, and Canada, well, that's going to have the persuasive weight that you think it's going to have. It's obvious that it's not showing anything approaching an international consensus. Uh, and I think we're, the court's not going to go that route for exactly that reason. And um, I think there's a self-correcting mechanism here, which there is not in history. Um, there's kind of this Alice in Wonderland quality with regard to how the court, how originalists on the court do his, so it's if Justice Scalia has no idea how he feels about the Eighth Amendment, but he does research into the 18th century, and lo and behold, a clear answer emerges. Well, I happen to be clerking during uh, Harmelin versus Michigan, which was his last really extended excursion into the history of the Eighth Amendment. It, it's, it's not good. I mean, if, I, if he were one of my students when I was teaching history at Yale, it would have gotten a C. And that's a good, you know, good grade, I guess. At, uh, uh, or not at, at that point, it wasn't a good grade at Yale. Um, so the idea, <laughs> you know, the idea that, you know, history provides this firm, sure guide is just, is just a myth. And, you know, and if it is true that justices use international law to put window dressing on their preconceived notions of what's right and wrong, I would argue, again, that's at least as true with regard to history as with many other uh, areas. So it either all comes in or it all doesn't. And I've yet to hear an argument that things are any worse or better with international law. A follow-up of sorts. Uh how much of the debate about foreign law that we've seen as a reaction to Atkins and Roper and Lawrence is about the results and, Atkin, and the issues at Atkins and Roper and Lawrence and not about the use of foreign law? Well, obviously, the people who are using the law to reach results they want or citing the law to reach results they want are happy with those results, and people criticizing them are not. But if you look at the uses of uh, international law, the, the sources that are cited to say, well, of course, we should do away with the death penalty because everybody's done away with the death penalty, or we shouldn't use it to put uh, minors to death because others don't use it to... We don't use those same sources when we talk about abortion rights because those same sources are more restrictive than the people doing the citation want to be on abortion rights. We don't talk about them on free speech issues or hate codes or any of the things where the politics of the people invoking them run the other way. We ought to be looking for ways to constrain judges more, not less, to give them more sure guidance, not less, and to give everybody who is looking at what courts do more basis for predictability, not less. And on that score, again, I don't think it is a sufficient answer to say other things are manipulable too. Yeah, on that, I mean, one thing is no one other than me in this one constrained area is saying that because a whole lot of countries do something, we should do it. You know, all we're saying is this is relevant information in the, you know, pan, in, in, in the effort to use a lot of different sources, largely domestic, to try to figure out what's going on uh, and how best to interpret it. Um, this is my point about persuasive uh, weight uh, rather than binding weight. My point about knowledge is more knowledge is better than less knowledge. Um, and, you know, again, uh, I've, I've yet to hear why this particular field of knowledge is any more dangerous or provides less guidance than um, others like uh, history or economics. Quite the contrary. You know, again, it is when it comes to something like abortion or something like free speech rights, the way the Supreme Court has used uh, international law and comparative law, and in the way I uh, advocate that it do so, neither principle has rise to the level of international consensus that would justify the court saying it has. Um, a lot of countries ban abortion, a lot of countries don't. There is, you know, and any attempt to say that the uh, international community is speaking with relatively one voice on that issue is, you know, uh, is not going to be credible or convincing. Same with hate speech. 
Um, my point is that when comparative law, when what other nations do, rise to the level of customary international law, and that's a very, very hard thing to do, um, and it's only in the context of things like, as we've seen so far, the juvenile death penalty, and only in the context of things like, as we've seen so far, um, uh, the death penalty, at, not in general, but as regards to handicap, at that point, you know, I think that that is something that is entirely appropriate for the court to point to. And that's a consensus that is much easier to show than these sort of glib statements that justices left or right say that the founders thought X or the founders thought Y. Here I go back to Justice Jackson's famous concurrence in Youngstown. He says, Interpreting just what our forefathers, here's, I'll, I'll invade, uh, I'll go from the Irish to the Jewish. He says, interpreting just what our forefathers might have uh, envisioned with regard to various doctrines in modern circumstances are things that are almost, is a task almost as enigmatic as the uh, dreams Joseph was called uh, upon to interpret for Pharaoh. Right. It's great writing, but what is he saying? He's saying history largely gives us confusion. And then he drops a quote, uh, drops a footnote where he has Hamilton saying there should be a lot of presidential power and our friend James Madison saying, oh, no, no, there should be not a lot of presidential power in foreign affairs. Okay, so if you're talking about guidance, I would much rather rely on what 190 out of 200 countries say than on competing quotes of the founders. Professor Flaherty, Dean Cass, thank you very much for these very thought-provoking and, and, and very interesting comments. Uh, I personally look forward to seeing the future of this debate and hope that maybe we can come back in a few years and uh, see where this debate has gone, especially with the new members on the Supreme Court and see how the lower courts have treated this issue and see if there is uh, a backlash, as you suggested, or the possibility of a back backlash on issues in which there is perhaps less of an international consensus, but still in which uh, you could certainly find substantial international support for uh, less liberal outcomes. Thank you very much, and thanks to the audience. Thank you.